we have a, a quick overview over uh, prospects for multi-wavelength and in particular high energy polarization uh, of blazars. Um, if you have heard my talk at COSPAR earlier this year, then much of what I'm saying and showing it's going to look very similar. Um, so let's start out with some of the main questions that we're still trying to answer, trying to understand about blazars, which is the source of jet power, what drives the jets, what's the physics of jet launching, and in particular, what's the role of the magnetic fields in jet launching, collimation, and acceleration? What's the composition of the jets, and in particular, what's the high energy emitting particles, leptonic or hadronic emission uh, scenarios? Uh, what accelerates particles, shocks, shear layers, magnetic reconnection, what's the role of magnetic fields there, and the location uh, of the gamma ray emission region. And uh, I'll uh, show a few examples of how multi-wavelength and high energy polarimetry can help us actually make progress along these fronts. So just a quick recap, I'm sure many of these uh, you have seen this. Uh, high energy emission can either be produced by leptons, the same electrons that make the low energy synchrotron emission uh, with X-rays and gamma rays uh, produced by Compton scattering either of the synchrotron radiation, the co-moving produced, uh, the synchrotron self Compton, or by external sources, accretion just be allowed, dust stores that external Compton. Alternatively, high energy emission can be produced by co-spatially accelerated protons to ultra relativistic energies where gamma rays are produced by the proton synchrotron or decay products of charged and neutral protons through cascades. Uh, now, this is one of the main questions, what makes the high energy emission? Uh, unfortunately, pure SED modeling does usually not give us the answer. It's generally possible to model SEDs with both leptonic and hadronic models. So we need alternative measures to distinguish. And one way to do that is, I mean, of course, there's neutrinos. If we can associate neutrinos with blazars, then we know there's hadronic processes at play. Variability may help to distinguish, but this conference is about polarization, so I'll talk about distinguishing through polarization signatures. Just a little bit background. I don't think I need to explain synchrotron radiation to this audience. I just have this in here for reference. A little less known is probably that Compton scattering may also induce polarization, and that uh, the polarization, the Compton cross section is polarization dependent. And this formula here, E, is the electric field vector uh, of the incoming uh, X ray or gamma ray, E prime, that's one of the scattered. And through this uh, dependence on the uh, of the cross section you see in the thompson regime in the electron rest frame this is in the electron rest frame if the scattered uh, photon energy is the same as essentially the same as the uh, incoming uh, energy then we have two plus uh, two minus two is zero then the cross section is really just given by this dot product of the uh, polarization vectors and that means that scattering will happen primarily in the plane perpendicular to the polarization vector and the polarization direction is preserved if the scattering happens of non-relativistic electrons. So now that means if we have a, a radiation beam coming in, say, from the top in this illustration, and we have an observer looking to the side, if scattering happens then at 90 degrees towards the observer, uh, then only those photons with polarization direction perpendicular to the plane of scattering will be filtered out, so to say. So this induces uh, linear polarization. And my South African funding agency will be really happy to see that I have a black observer here. Um, so if we are scattering of uh, relativistic electrons, uh, then if the target photons are unpolarized, uh, relativistic aberration will essentially produce an asymmetrically symmetric uh, radiation field coming in that is scattered off that uh, will result in unpolarized high energy emission. If the target photons are polarized, that means we have uh, synchrotron self Compton scattering, uh, then the SSC polarization is about one half of the target synchrotron polarization. So if we put all this together in a very rough sketch, uh, the, um, in the bottom, I just show the different components of the SED at the top, the polarization that they will produce. Of course, we have direct uh, contributions, for example, from the dust torus or from uh, the broadline region or from the accretion disk. Those will be expected to be unpolarized. Um, then we have synchrotron radiation that is polarized, of course, but where the dust torus or 
accretion disk or other unpolarized components make a significant contribution. Of course, the total degree of polarization is expected to go down there. Then we have synchrotron self-Compton, which is polarized at about half the degree of synchrotron. And then we have at highest energies uh, in, say, FSRQ type blazars, uh, external Compton dominating that is unpolarized. In the case of um, hadronic models, because in the low energy regime, nothing's changing. We still have electron synchrotron radiation there, but the high energy emission results from all synchrotron radiation. Ultimately, it's proton synchrotron or synchrotron radiation from secondary particles in the cascades. So you expect a very high degree of polarization comparable to the polarization in the low frequency synchrotron component. Uh, of course, we've done a little better than the sketch. Uh, Hao Cheng actually, in his PhD thesis, has calculated the high energy polarization signatures for leptonic and hadronic uh, radiation models. And so, if we talk about low frequency peeped uh, blazars, FSRQ type blazars, uh, in those, the X rays are produced in leptonic models by synchrotron self Compton. So, you expect a relatively moderate degree of uh, polarization. Uh, whereas in hadronic models, uh, everything is synchrotron, you expect high degrees of polarization, both in X-rays and in gamma rays. Uh, one more element here of uh, FSRQs, uh, a new work by a PhD student of mine, Hester Skirte. Uh, if one looks at the optical polarization of these uh, flat spectrum radio quasar type uh, blazars, we have, of course, synchrotron from the jet dominating most of the optical spectrum, but there can be a significant component from direct accretion disk emission that's often not directly distinguishable from the SED itself. <clears throat> However, if one does spectropolarimetry, one can see the degree, the decrease of polarization towards uh, high frequencies or uh, short wavelengths, and that actually allows you to constrain uh, uh, quite uh, tightly the contribution of the accretion disk and thereby the accretion disk spectrum. And with the assumption that we're dealing with a Shakuras and Yaev accretion disk, um, we uh, can effectively measure the black hole mass. This is a work just submitted to AppJ by his descriptor and collaborators. Now, if we go to intermediate uh, blazars, intermediate synchrotron peaked blazars, there the X rays are often dominated by electron synchrotron radiation in both scenarios, leptonic or hadronic. So you expect a high degree of synchrotron polarization, but the high energy gamma ray emission uh, would then often be dominated by SSC, so relatively moderate polarization, whereas hadronic models again give you a high degree of gamma ray polarization. Uh, now, further, uh, one specific example of an intermediate peaked uh, BLAC object is this uh, object AO0235 plus 164, that shows probably the, the strongest example of what one calls the big blue bump or soft X ray excess, depending on from what side of the bump you're looking at. And we've actually modeled in uh, bearing it out this. Uh, component as a bulk uh, Compton signature. That means Comptonization of a thermal pool of electrons of an external radiation field that produces an X-rays. And now there's, of course, uh, other alternatives what it could be. It could simply be a signature of the accretion disk, maybe a corona that would be a very low polarization. It could be an additional synchrotron component of a second population of electron that would be moderately polarized. Or it can be just this bulk Compton uh, component. And uh, my PhD student, Wente Dreyer, has uh, developed uh, polarization dependent uh, Compton scattering Monte Carlo code and evaluated the degree of polarization that you would expect if this actually results from the bulk Compton component and finds that this can actually be up to 30, 40, almost 50% polarized. So X ray polarization, soft X ray polarization would really tell you. Uh, if this could actually be the bulk Compton component. Now, in high frequency peak BLR objects, we're dealing with X rays dominated by electron synchrotron radiation. And here, uh, Fabrizio Tavecchio has done a nice uh, series of papers uh, showing that, well, what you see in X rays is fresh. If we are dealing with shock acceleration, uh, what we're seeing in X rays is synchrotron from freshly accelerated electrons right at the shock front. You expect very ordered magnetic fields and a high degree uh, of polarization, most likely much higher than we see in the optical, because optical emitting synchrotron electrons uh, probe a much larger region 
uh, along the jet that averages out over different magnetic field orientations uh, and you would expect lower degree of polarization. Whereas in magnetic reconnection, in particular, uh, if we're dealing with larger structures, we have multiple of these uh, merging uh, magnetic islands uh, acting together at the same time, uh, you would average out over very turbulent regions. So you would expect generally uh, much lower degrees of polarization than you could get with shock acceleration. So this could really help you diagnose the mode of particle acceleration in blazars. A similar trend, has actually been uh, observed so that this prediction that near the synchrotron peak or beyond the synchrotron peak you see freshly accelerated electrons uh, in much uh, resulting in a much higher degree of polarization as they probe a smaller uh, emitting region whereas at lower frequencies below the synchrotron peak you're averaging out over larger regions and expect a lower degree of polarization this has actually been uh, found also by Manolis Angelakis et al. in 2016 based on RoboPol data showing that as one uh, does a population study and looks at the average degree of polarization uh, as a function of the location of the synchrotron peak we see that in high frequency peak Bialak objects uh, at the optical, we are looking at frequencies much below the synchrotron uh, peak frequency, so we expect a low degree of polarization. Whereas at the low frequency peak, Bialak, uh, low frequency Bialak and FSRQs, we are looking near or even beyond the synchrotron peak, and we expect a much higher, or at least occasionally, a much higher degree of polarization, which actually perfectly fits in uh, with Svetlana's main results that FSRQs show more frequent uh, high polarization events. Um, now, I, I can't imagine that you've seen this plot before in this conference, uh, so let me just show it again, <clears throat> and again, uh, make also the, the caveats that Hao Cheng has pointed out. Polarization angles are known to swing, then are known to be variable, and uh, if we're talking about X-ray and gamma ray polarimetry, we will typically need uh, observation times of several days that may be longer than the times of these polarization angle swings. So if one does not have a way to correct for this, maybe use the optical polarization angle as a template for what you expect in X-rays, then it is really impossible to actually measure that uh, polarization with these long uh, durations. And the problem is, if this, for example, if the variability is through magnetic reconnection, as we've seen in Hao Cheng's uh, talk, then the optical and X-ray polarization angle variability does not really have to be correlated, and then it is really a problem. Um, one other complication, uh, if we are dealing with hadronic models, that's also a paper by uh, Hao Cheng in 2016, another PhD student of mine, um, where we have uh, done uh, shock, acceler shock acceleration scenarios for this, these polarization angle swings where we have shown that just a shock moving through a straight jet paraded by a helical magnetic field, we can reproduce the optical polarization angle swings by multiples of 180 degrees. Uh, however, if the X-rays and gamma rays are produced by hadronic processes by proton synchrotron, protons cool on much longer time scales. They probe a much larger volume. You do not expect uh, very pronounced polarization angle variability in that case. So you would have a polarization angle swing still in the optical, but the high energy emission would not uh, mirror that. So that's another complication that one cannot rely on the optical polarization angle to kind of mirror what we see in the X-rays or gamma rays. So this is just summary. So let me just uh, come to my summary. Um, as I think I've motivated with just a few salient examples, <laughs> is that X-ray uh, high energy photometry can really help uh, answer a couple of questions. Uh, X-ray optical co-spatiality, if X-rays and optical emission are really produced co-spatial, then of course you would expect the polarization signatures to be very similar. Uh, mode of particle acceleration, shocks versus magnetic reconnection may be probed with high energy polarimetry. We can probe leptonic versus hadronic high energy emission uh, scenarios. Uh, we may probe the origin uh, of the big blue bump seen in a few blazar uh, SEDs. Uh, and again, the caveat that uh, polarization angle swings may really be a problem for actually analyzing 
the data from instruments like IHPE or Amigo if they're being launched. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Please raise your hand. Yes, I have. If I could you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. So uh, the, the swing in the optical polarization, I could not catch what is the reason for the, that you have only swing in the polarization angle of the optical polarization. So in, in this uh, <clears throat> scenario that, that we show the results of here, we have a straight jet pervaded by a helical magnetic field. And as we have a localized emission region, the shock moves through, accelerates particles along the shock front. We probe uh, light travel times uh, become very uh, important, light travel times across the emission region. As if we're looking at a critical superluminal angle of one over gamma at a blazar jet in the co-moving frame, we're actually looking perpendicular to the jet. So as this starts, we start seeing only parts of the jet that are on the side to which you're looking with a certain magnetic field orientation. As we're going later and later, we're seeing uh, parts that are further and further back through the jet, and thereby we're essentially tracing out the whole swing of the magnetic field along this uh, helical magnetic field trajectory. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.